Today on Cook's Country, Bridget and Julia make slow cooker Memphis-style wet ribs. Jack challenges Julia to a tasting of apple cider vinegar. And Ashley shows Bridget the secrets to the best mashed potato cakes. That's all right here on Cook's Country. The original slow cooker, known as the electric casserole, <laughs> that was invented back in the 1930s. Mm -hmm, but it didn't become a standard appliance in the American kitchen until Rival debuted the crock pot in 1971. By then, more women were working outside of the home, and the crock pot made it so easy to put a hot dinner on the table. Mm -hmm. And the slow cooker is even more popular today, and sales have doubled in the past 10 years. Well, that's because recipes have finally caught up, and these days folks are using it for everything. I mean everything. There's nachos, <laughs> mashed potatoes, creme brulee, and even cheesecake. Mm -hmm. And today we're going to show you how to barbecue in your slow cooker and make some Memphis-style wet ribs. When I think of making barbecue, I think of charcoal and hardwood and a grill and maybe even a smoker. But I don't think about a slow cooker. I don't either. But the promise of big outdoor flavor and the convenience of a slow cooker, well, it does sound pretty darn tempting. But mm -hmm. without the right recipe, you end up with that. I've seen that before. This is stew. It's not barbecue. And let me show you the problem. It's all this liquid that was added to the slow cooker. All that flavor is washed out of the meat and into that liquid. Now, will I take this off to the side and eat it and probably drink all this liquid later on? Yes, I will, but it is not barbecue. All right, I'm going to go take this off to the side. So before we get cooking, let's talk about buying ribs at the supermarket. Now there's up to three different kinds of ribs that you might find, and let's go through them. Here we have a St. Louis style rib, here we have a full spare rib, and here we have a baby back rib. Now these two cuts, the St. Louis and the spare rib, are cut from the same part of the pig, from the belly area. In fact, if I pick up the St. Louis rack and I put it on top of the spare ribs, you can see how much bigger the spare rib is. Now this brisket part of the belly is attached to the spare rib, making it much bigger, and that will change the cooking time dramatically. Now when it comes to baby back ribs, they're from a different part of the pig altogether. They're from the back, so they have more bones, less meat, and require yet a different cooking time. So when you're shopping for ribs, it's important to know which kind you're buying and why. Well today, we're buying the St. Louis spare ribs. All right. Now each of these racks weighs between two and a half to three pounds. The reason that we chose St. Louis, it's cut from the spare rib, so it's got plenty of fat, intramuscular tissue. That's going to mean more tender and juicy ribs. Most importantly, we can fit two racks in our slow cooker. Oh, good. Yeah, so we're gonna make a lot of ribs. I'm gonna cut it right in half. So let me find a meaty section there. Just cut it right in half. And we'll move on down the line, as they say. All right. So another problem with slow cooker recipes, they don't treat these like barbecue. They just put them into the slow cooker, maybe dump some barbecue sauce on there. We're gonna treat these as if they were going outside, and that means starting with a rub. So this is two tablespoons of paprika, just regular paprika. I've got a tablespoon of packed brown sugar. You can mm. use either light or dark. A tablespoon of kosher salt. We've got two teaspoons of granulated garlic and two teaspoons of onion powder. And that's two teaspoons of ground black pepper. All right, let's just mash this together, get any lumps out of that brown sugar. All right, that looks good. Now I wanna take a tablespoon of this and reserve it because we're gonna use it a little bit later on. Oh, secret spice for later. Secret spice. <laughs> we're gonna make a perfume with it. <laughs> so I'll take some paper towels and blot them dry because we want that spice rub to stick. We still have the membrane on these. You don't need to take that off. It's actually gonna help them hold together. All right, let's start getting some of the spice rub on there. I know my hands are gonna get messy and I'm fine with it. Mm -hmm. Make sure that we get plenty on all sides and the ribs get a rub down. It's starting to look like a real barbecue over there. Doesn't it? So now it's time to put them in the slow cooker and how we put them in there is going to affect how they cook. You see, if you look at the side of one of these ribs, mm -hmm. you've got a fatter end over here, you've got a thinner end over here. We want that wider end to go down and we want the meatier side to go around the edges of the slow cooker. That's so that they cook more evenly. Now these will overlap, and that is fine. All right, lid is going wait, on. Wait, wait, there's no liquid in there. You're right, there's no liquid in there. As these cook, they are going to start to give off some of their liquid, not a whole lot, but that means that they won't have that washed out flavor. Interesting, so it's a dry slow cooker. It's a dry slow cooker. Now, you have two choices when you're using your slow cooker. You can cook it on high for five to six hours, or you can go for low, and that's gonna take about six to seven hours. We're gonna go for low today. Low and slow. That's right. All 
right. Ooh, look at all that liquid in there. Yeah, see it gave off some of that liquid, but it's nowhere near that amount that was in that bowl from earlier. We're done with the slow cooker at this point. So I wanna get these out. We're gonna put them on a wire rack set over a rimmed baking sheet. I went ahead and lined that sheet with aluminum foil. Later on, you're gonna see it's gonna help with cleanup. As these cool down for 10 minutes, they're gonna dry out a little bit on the top. That's gonna make it easy for us to apply our barbecue sauce. It's gonna to stick to those ribs. Mm. Stick to the ribs. Stick to the ribs. Speaking of sauce, this is a very easy, pantry-friendly sauce. And like all good things, it starts with ketchup. <laughs> <laughs> so this is three-quarter cup of ketchup. All right, and I've got six tablespoons of apple juice. Huh, you find that a lot in especially Memphis style ribs. Sometimes they'll brush them with apple juice and it makes it really, really, really good. So it's two tablespoons of molasses. So we're going all over the country here. <laughs> two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar. Two tablespoons of Worcestershire. I've got a tablespoon of yellow mustard. Gotta love the hot dog mustard. All right, got a teaspoon of ground black pepper. Little kick, mm -hmm. a little bit of liquid smoke. Quarter teaspoon, if you wouldn't mind handing. Oh, the secret spice. That's right, that's our secret spice. That goes right in, and that's a tablespoon. All right, so I'll whisk this together. All right, that is it, very easy. Nice and easy, all pantry staples. Goes together like that. And it cooks very fast too. We're gonna bring it up to the boil, and then we're gonna lower that heat, let it simmer for about 10 minutes until it's reduced to a cup. That's it, easy peasy. That is a quick cooking sauce, Ooh, 10 that's, minutes. That's nice and thick. It is nice and thick. All right, so this is ready to go on those ribs. Again, those have also sat there conveniently for 10 minutes. So the surface is nice and dry. We're gonna go ahead and brush it with some of the sauce, about half the sauce that's in here. That's about a half a cup. So we're gonna just slather it all over the place. Ooh, that makes those ribs look a lot better. Now it's looking like barbecue. Mm -hmm. You're painting them on very artistically. You like that? I do. I've got this Bob Ross method. <laughs> <laughs> it's a happy little rib right it's there. It's a happy rib. All right, this is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Now we're gonna save the rest of that sauce for just a moment, but these are going to go into the oven under the broiler. We wanna leave them in there for about four minutes. Oh, so a little glazing effect. Exactly, it's gonna look like barbecue. Now those ribs are really close to that broiler element. That is totally by design. So this rack is about three inches from the broiler element. Those ribs are about an inch away. That means really, really good char, kind of like what would happen on a grill. Ah, all right. Now, take a look at that. That is some good looking barbecue. It looks like it came right out of the smoker, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. We're not quite done yet. We've got the rest of this beautiful sauce. I'm gonna shellac it right at the end. Oh, these look so different than when they came out of that slow cooker. There's no stew here. I'm entranced. It is mesmerizing. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, mm -hmm. so good. Mm -hmm. Patience, patience. We have to wait 20 minutes to tuck into these. They need to rest. A little piece of foil right on top. And again, we're gonna tent this and let it sit for about 20 minutes. All right, big reveal. Et voila. <laughs> <laughs> Those are gorgeous. And what you don't see is a whole bunch of juice underneath the ribs. They're not swimming in it because we didn't add it to the slow cooker. That means all the flavor is in there, and you don't have to take my word for it. I'm gonna cut them Enough up now. Enough of this, <laughs> more of this. <laughs> all right, so let me cut these for you. Now, I like to cut them upside down because just take a knife and you can go right in between the ribs. Makes it much easier to see. Mm. Mm. All right, how many ribs would you like? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> a full skeleton, please. <laughs> I'll give you three. Oh, nice. Because one is never enough. One's never enough. All right, I'm just gonna dig in. Please do. Mmm. Super tender. And I like that sauce. It's a little, got a little bit of kick to it. Mm -hmm. Must've been that secret spice you added. Mmm. Mmm. Mm -hmm. So juicy, too. It is really juicy, because mm -hmm. again, the juice wasn't in the bowl at the end, it's in the ribs. That's right, and that's where all the flavor is. So to make killer Memphis-style ribs in the slow cooker, start in Missouri. Buy St. Louis-style ribs and give them a good rub down with a flavorful spice rub. Then arrange the ribs in the slow cooker with the thick ends pointing down and the meaty side facing out and cook them without any liquid until they're just tender. To finish the ribs and give them a saucy glazed exterior, run them under the broiler and baste them with a sweet smoky barbecue sauce. And there you have it. From Cook's Country, the best recipe for slow cooker Memphis-style wet ribs. That's a mouthful. That is a mouthful. That's a better mouthful. Yeah, I agree.
Today, we're going to be tasting apple cider vinegar. And now, a lot of folks say apple cider vinegar is good for your health. It cures everything from weight loss and acne to hiccups and even helps with teeth whitening. But the real question today for Jack is which brand tastes best? Yeah, we'll see what you're thinking after you drink all of this. I'm a little worried. <laughs> yeah, so we have three vinegars here. First thing you're going to notice is some differences in appearance. So, they are very different looking. Yeah, so this is really about filtering, and mm -hmm. I'm not sure it's such a big factor. Some are filtered, mm -hmm. some are not. So we did the tasting four ways, the way mm -hmm. you're doing it, pan sauce, coleslaw, and barbecue sauce. Oh, barbecue sauce. Yeah, you, sorry, no barbecue sauce today. You're getting it straight up. I'm getting uh, some crackers. <laughs> <laughs> so start drinking. Now, the big thing you want to be paying attention to is the level of acidity and the amount of sort of fruit and sweetness. These are somewhere between 5% and 5.3% acidity. So as vinegars go, these are actually fairly low acid. So if you think about it, like a sherry vinegar or a balsamic can often be 6 or 7% yeah. acidity. And so these are less potent. And this is the American vinegar. You know, Spain has sherry vinegar, Italy has balsamic. This is what, uh, in colonial America, they used this to, as you said, clean their teeth, mm -hmm. clean their house. Cider was the main alcoholic beverage uh, before <laughs> beer. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I think I'll have a cracker. <laughs> It's a little strong, mm -hmm. small sips, dear. <laughs> so we sent these all out to the lab that we mm -hmm. used to analyze them for sugar content and acidity. The acidic content didn't vary all that much, but it was perceived very differently depending on how much sugar was there. Mm. So um, anything that you are immediately noticing besides the obvious that they look <laughs> different from each other, mm -hmm. do you feel like they taste different from yeah, each other? Yeah, I do. They do have different flavors and it's very noticeable. I coughed when I drank this one because I didn't like it. Okay. It was too harsh, it was almost salty. I might have a different opinion if it was in a vinaigrette or a barbecue sauce. I might like that sort of push of acidity to shine through, but drinking it straight, this was a little much for me. Yeah, and we did find the ones that were really harsh here. That was a better trait in something like a barbecue sauce where you've got spices and tomatoes and molasses and you really want the vinegar to do its job. What about the yeah. two on the ends? Um, this one was a little stinky, a little stinky around the edges, but I actually liked that. It reminded me of sauerkraut or other fermented things, and that was positive to me. My favorite sipping vinegar was this one. It was balanced, it had a good sweetness on the end, and in terms of just sipping it, it just, it tasted good. Okay. Where do you want to start? With what you liked or what you didn't like? Let's start with what I didn't like. Okay. This one. This is Heinz. Mm -hmm. So this is the winner. It does better in the expert panel in the other tests when mm. we started cooking with it. The studio audience wasn't wild about the Heinz either because no. it's very strong. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a good trait when you're cooking, less desirable trait when you're drinking. In a cocktail. Yeah, in a cocktail. <laughs> Let's move on to the unfiltered one next, which had that sort of stinky flavor that I actually liked. You were the only one who liked that. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. That, uh. I, I, I kind of <laughs> figured that was coming. Uh, now, this is at the bottom of the rankings. This one had um, some odd notes that the panel didn't like. It's fine vinegar, but it was our lowest rated. All right. And then this one, which was my favorite. You are in agreement with these lovely hey. people out here. They chose this because this is the one that has some residual sugar in it mm -hmm. to balance all that acidity. It was the overall runner up once we finished all four tastings, but it's a great vinegar. All right, so there you have it. When buying apple cider vinegar, either go with Heinz, which has a really potent flavor, or think about choosing White House, which has a nice sweetness. I love leftovers, and I'm not the only one. In this 1960s cookbook called the I Hate To Cookbook, Peg Bracken wrote, well, some women can keep a leftover going like an eight-day clock. Their Sunday's roast becomes Monday's hash, which becomes Tuesday's stuffed peppers, which eventually turn up as tamale pie and so on, until it disappears or daddy does. Well, we don't have daddy here, but we have Ashley, and we're going to find out what happens when you can't count on leftovers. So Ashley's going to show us how to make great mashed potato cakes from scratch. Yes, I am. <laughs> and we don't want to settle here because mashed potato cakes are traditionally made with leftover mashed potatoes. But the problem is you never know how much dairy or butter somebody used in that original recipe. So the potato cakes can turn out really loose or really gluey. So we found that the best way was to make the filling ourselves. We're control freaks. I love we it. We are. So these are two and a half pounds of russet potatoes, which we chose because we like the starchier texture and also they were a lot fluffier when they got mashed. And we peeled and had these lengthwise and then cut them into quarter inch slices. Okay. So I'm just going to put these into this saucepan here. 
and I'm going to fill the saucepan with some water. And you just want to cover it by about one inch. That looks good. We have one tablespoon of salt, and this will help for seasoning the potatoes while they cook. Bring this water to a boil, reduce the heat to medium low, and simmer the potatoes until they're done, which will take about eight to 10 minutes. So we're not breaking any new ground here. We're boiling potatoes, right? Exactly. All right. All right, so it's been about eight minutes. And the way you know that the potatoes are done is that you insert this paring knife here, and if it meets no resistance, yeah. they're done. Tender, tender. Tender, tender. I'm gonna drain these, and I put them back into the saucepan. I'm gonna leave them here for about five minutes just to cool down a little bit, and also just to let any excess moisture evaporate off. Okay, so it's been about five minutes, and these seem to have cooled down a bit. Now it's time to add the flavorful ingredients to our mashed potatoes. First, I'm gonna start with one ounce of finely grated Parmesan cheese, which is about a half a cup. Cheesy mash, yay! Cheesy mash, one egg yolk. The Parmesan and the egg yolk are gonna act both as binders. We have a quarter cup of chopped fresh chives here, three quarter teaspoon salt, and one quarter teaspoon of pepper. And I'm gonna mash these all together in the saucepan. And you wanna do this until it's nice and smooth. But you'll notice I haven't put any milk or any butter in here. No, nothing. And that'll fry up better because it's more cohesive. All right, I'd say these look about right. I'm gonna move over here to this large bowl and just scrape out the mixture. And everything's really nicely incorporated. Mm -hmm. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna transfer this to the refrigerator just to let it completely cool for about one hour. All right, Bridget, so these have been in the refrigerator for one hour and they are nice and cool. We have two shallow pie plates and here we have two eggs and here we have two cups of panko breadcrumbs. Lightly beat these eggs here. This is gonna be our glue. And using this half cup measure, we are going to, and yes, I said we, divide this mashed potato cake filling into eight portions. And I was wondering, would you help I will. Okay. Are you going to show me one? I will. All right. All right. So what I'm going to do is form each patty three inches wide, and it's going to be three quarters of an inch thick in height. All right. So I'm going to just lightly put this in the egg coating here. You can use a fork. You don't have to use a fork. You can just use your old forks, your hands, if you'd prefer to. And let any excess drip off. All right. And then place it into the panko. I'm going to go for here. Thank you. Yes, that's great. And the only thing I would ask is just be sure not to forget about the sides because you want to make sure that all the sides get really nicely breaded there. All right. And then we have a large plate here that we can put all of our formed patties onto. Does that look good? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Thanks. Wow. <laughs> this isn't your first rodeo. I don't know. All right, we've got the last one. Great job. I'm just going to leave these here on the counter for about five minutes, and the eggs and the breadcrumbs are going to form together and just form a really nice outer shell. Sticking together. Yep. So I have a half a cup of vegetable oil, which I've been heating over medium-high heat, and it looks like it's about shimmering, which is what I wanted it to do. Yes. All right, and I'm going to put four carefully into the skillet. We're going to cook this for about three minutes on the first side until nice and golden brown. And I'm going to go around and press it just to make sure that all of the mashed potato cake is in contact with the oil. Contact means brown. Perfect. All right, it's been three minutes. So using two spatulas, I am going to flip them carefully. Yummy. Those look yeah. magnificent. And they're holding their shape. All right, so I'm going to cook the second side for about two minutes until that side is golden brown as well. Okay, it has been two minutes, and I just checked, and the bottoms look perfect. So do you mind just holding that paper towel line plate there for me? I will do whatever you want as long as I get a mashed potato cake at the end. Maybe you'll get two. <gasps> so I'm using the paper towels here just to collect any extra grease or oil. Thank you very All much. All right. And now what I'm going to do is some of the panko breadcrumbs get really dark. So instead of burning my second batch or making them look a little freckled, I'm going to discard this oil and use fresh oil for the second okay. batch. And for extra insurance, I'm going to wipe out the skillet with a lot of paper towels here. And because it's nonstick, it comes up really, really easily. All right, nice empty skillet. Now I'm gonna heat this again over medium high heat with a fresh half cup of vegetable oil. So I'm gonna heat this oil until it's shimmering and I'm gonna cook the second batch of mashed potato cakes for the same amount of time. Three minutes for the first side until golden brown. Flip them with my two spatulas, two minutes on the second side. And then we're close to done? Close to done. Sweet. Yeah. 
Bridget, the moment is almost here and I'm excited. Squeak! Yeah. <laughs> Alright, so it's been three minutes on the first side, two minutes on the second side. Alright, I'm going to transfer the remaining four to this paper towel line plate. Make some room here for Daddy. Oh yeah, and Mama. <laughs> <laughs> I've never made mashed potato cakes that look anything close to this. You know, usually, they're so kind of loose. It's more like an actual pancake than right, a cake. Right, right. I'm starving. Uh, yeah, you think? <laughs> <laughs> and you can see here we have some sour cream for a little topping, and you're going to thank me later for that, I promise. I'm probably going to thank you now. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to do a big cheers. I would too. <laughs> oh, you hear those crunchy, crispy, Ooh. Definitely. And the inside, really fluffy. Really fluffy. It's like everything I like in a twice-baked potato, but crispy and crunchy on the outside. You nailed it. <laughs> that, is act, that is perfect because it really does taste like that creamy kind interior of, that. of a twice-baked potato. Yeah. And I love that you didn't have to cook anything other than the potatoes. Mm -hmm. So you weren't sauteing onions and garlic and all. Really simple. Very smart. Oh, I well, think. Mm. Who needs leftovers? I sure don't, because our mashed potato cakes are the best because they're made from scratch. You start with boiled russet potatoes, then to bind the potato filling, mash the spuds with an egg yolk and Parmesan cheese. That Parmesan cheese adds tons of flavor. Shape, then bread the cakes with panko crumbs and fry them in two batches for the ultimate hearty, crunchy coating. So there you have it from Cook's Country, the best recipe for mashed potato cakes. You can get this recipe and all the recipes from this season, along with our tastings, testings, and select episodes at cookscountry.com. I'm gonna tear into the rest of this. Oh, me too, girl. Thanks for watching Cook's Country from America's Test Kitchen. So what'd you think? Leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or just say hi. Now you can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. Alligator. <laughs>